I actually had something come to mind earlier. Okay. okay. I didn't know when it would be, so this is perfect. Yeah, this okay. invitation. So, <clears throat> really powerful practice for me over the last few years. Really coming out of the NFL, this is one of the simple things I started doing. Just walking around anywhere I'd find myself is just start tuning into my breath and just start to let go of any tension. And it starts more on the surface, like maybe you're holding your shoulder up, you just let that go. Let your shoulders get heavy, come down away from your ears. <sighs> just going a little deeper, maybe there's something lingering in your hips or your belly, just whatever tension is there, just let it go. Tune into your breath. Feel the weight of your body being pulled down into the earth. Bring your attention to the sounds of the environment that we're in. And just breathing and letting go of a little bit of tension at a time. Maybe there's some mental tension you need to let go of. You let that go too. Maybe your heart's beating a little faster than you'd like it to be right now. You could just see if you can slow it down with your breath. You can just open your eyes whenever you're ready and feel how that feels in your body and your hands and your feet. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, man. Thanks for that opportunity. <laughs> it's a pleasure. So welcome to Peak Mind. I'm your host, Michael Trainer, and I am here with two now great friends, Jared and Evan. Gentlemen, it's an honor. Likewise. Same, brother. So I first of all just want to root this and honor this moment. And Jared, you for putting this together. We are in Hell's Canyon. As you can see, we have the mighty Snake River behind us, and we are on an epic transformational river journey. And I was mentioning at dinner that what struck me as someone who grew up in the city with my nervous system always unaware is that for the last two days, we haven't seen anyone else. We've just been floating and moving with the ebbs and tides of the river. And it struck me that that's such a gift. And I came in a little bit sick, and over the course of the last two days, I've just felt my nervous system totally release itself. And what it evoked in me was the, the, the power and potential of nature-based immersion, right? We call it nature-based immersion. It was just life for most humans, I think since time immemorial. But we are now in this very unique period in time where technology and time seems to be moving more and more exponentially quickly. And that oftentimes can feel like an assault on the nervous system. We now have also an epidemic of loneliness. Mm. Like one in three men identify as not having one person that they feel they could call on if things got challenging. And to me, a lot of that roots in the sense of disconnection. And one of the things that I want to honor and acknowledge you for is fostering a context wherein community can be, can be birthed and born. And I feel like I wanted to just kick off by setting that intention of, of talking about on this, the equinox, right? Solstice. The solstice, excuse me, the summer solstice. We are in a very, very uh, sacred time in the apex of, of the sun's dance with the earth, if you will. Maybe we could kick off with you, Jared. Can you talk a little bit about 
first the meaning of the solstice from your understanding a little bit. And then I'd like both of you to speak a little bit about, because both of you are, are masters of experience, about how you think about the ways in which we can orchestrate an experience such that it fosters the moreness in people, the more that's possible that wants to live inside of them. Yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's like, so good. yeah, it's such a, a funny thing that, you know, I, I try to, I do for things like this and then don't necessarily, you know, sit down to put into words exactly how I do what I'm doing. Um, but I'll certainly give it a college effort. Um, the solstice, the first question, the solstice, um, I think my answer is actually a sort of annual answer. Cause if it was the winter solstice or the spring or fall equinox or the cross quarters in between these dates, the halfway points in between them, um, which really marked the, the beginning of the year for some of the more you know ancient calendars like the celtic calendar um, so we celebrate these solstices equinoxes and cross quarters as the major holidays of the year so for me this is actually like a personal dream come true to have 17 people celebrate today is the actual summer solstice so it's june 21st um, and it's what time is it 8 30 at night maybe and it's super bright out it's a very special day in so many ways um, and so to celebrate this holiday festival in this way is really what I want in the world, you know, mm. for my daughter and for my family and for my friends. And that is because these are like, you know, what I would call the downbeats of the year. And so when we're in touch with these downbeats, we're, you know, on rhythm with the flow of nature. Um, and like you were saying, there's so many things that disconnect us from that. Mm. Um, we can name a thousand. And uh, the one of them is the calendar itself. So, or even like the clock. We're all off clock time now mm. for two days, primarily because we don't have phones and, and outlets. And, you know, a few people have watches, but we're just the calendar itself through religious and civic uh you know conveniences for the, for reasons that really have nothing to do with the flow of nature the calendar and the holidays and the festivals have all been adjusted to be more convenient and to fit into the the julian and then gregorian calendars uh, as opposed to the observational calendar of the sun goes up the sun goes down the sun angle is here the sun angle is there um there was you know the essentially probably a shaman in every community who would go out to a flat Mecca like this and set stones in certain parts of the field and track the movement of the sun and the stars and the planets. Machu Picchu does that. Exactly. And Stonehenge. No, they so, all align okay. to when the sun is at its highest apex. It's like the architecture, they actually uncovered architectural systems that were exact maps of the cosmos at that time in stone. Exactly. And so that's a mastery of what I'm talking about. Like you can go back even further before they got to that point and there was just a rock on the ground that, you know, where we had a long view of the horizon. So maybe we were on a high plateau or something. And, and these were the keepers of the seasons. Um, and so we would honor them with seasonal festivals which survive today as our holidays, mm. like Christmas and Easter and, and, and what have you, Halloween. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, it's a little too convenient how close they are to the solstices and the equinoxes and the cross quarters to be anything but just an evolution of our original relationship to the flow of nature. And so like Burning Man, for example, which you have experience with, um, the first Burning Man was on the solstice. It was later moved to the fall for whatever reason, I'm not sure, but I'm just saying the impulse of it, the lighting a huge bonfire, that's a solstice celebration. Mm -hmm. And midsummer in Scandinavia, solstice celebration, lighting fires, why? Because there's a huge ball of fire in the sky and we are the system. So if we're not disconnected from the system, the only appropriate thing to do is to light a huge fire. It's the time when everything's on fire. It's the time to reach up and look up to the sun when we went on our silent nature walk earlier, 
uh, and Dr. Nathan asked us to make observations of the plants that we saw without knowing what the plants were, but just the gestures that the plants make, which is an exercise that comes out of uh, our study of Rudolf Steiner. And the, the thing that I noticed was just how much everything was reaching up towards the sun. Um, and so that's what's happening right now. And on the winter solstice, you know, after all the leaves drop to the ground and all the energy goes down into the earth, we go inside, we go internal, we bring a tree inside, we light candles inside, we try to rekindle the light inside us, and we're looking forward to the next season. So these are the downbeats of the year, but they're also how we prepare for the year. Because when you're at the summer solstice, we know that yes, it's the peak amount of sunlight, which conversely means every day after this is less sunlight, soon enough we're at winter. So we better start preparing now for winter. Um, putting up, canning, preserving. And then, you know, there's modern maybe analogs to how you might act at this time if you're not a homesteader doing those types of things. Um, so, Look, Well, let's actually get dialed in on that. And so far as if there are things that are now contemporaries are doing, right? Like us in this context, right? How would, if someone is listening and they're like, okay, I'm a t I, I absolutely resonate with the idea of attuning with nature or right. the seasons, yeah. right? And these are markers to attune to the seasons. And maybe I'll actually ask you, uh, Eben, this because you had a season, which I think is, you know, there's the, there's the season that is, you know, sort of fall, summer, winter, spring, but there's also, and I think this replicates in the wis in, 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 in the experience of each of us, but also the wisdom that is, that is able to be released when we orient towards what I would call like our playoff season. Right. Mm. So I think, one of, the, one of the things that's been very helpful for me is within the context of our, of our nature-based seasons, thinking also about how we move through the ebbs and flows of our own lives. And oftentimes we need to give ourselves an off season. Like this, is, this week for me is an off season, which is enabling me to have all the flourishing of ideas to go into my playoff season sort of, you know, in, in the weeks to follow. Totally. You, you having a context of developing a rhythm and routine based in, you know, professional football, mm -hmm. I feel like might have some unique insights because I, I think that speaks to the moreness, right? Like how, you're, you're obviously oriented toward that North Star of sort of the championship, which many in our society emulates. Mm. And yet we also have this context of how we can align those seasons with the greater nature-based seasons. Do you have any insights around how you think about uh, the ways in which we both fall into and go into deep rest, as well as how we can think about performing at our highest. What's interesting about that is that playing football was so, it's so cyclical. Spring comes, you start training, you start spring practices, you're weightlifting, you're running sprints, you're starting to practice, you're putting on the helmet, running drills, running plays. And your nervous system, you do this year in, year out for 10, 15, 20 years. For me, it was 13 to 28. So you start in the spring, you start to train, prepare your body, lifting weights, running, practicing, scrimmaging, running through plays come into the summer it picks up more now you're starting to really get close to the season so now the pads come on we're lifting weights we're running plays we're scrimmaging at an amped up level the season comes and the season is a beast but you've done that two-week training camp of like it's two a days you wake up at 5 30 in the morning you've got uh 7 30 on the field for stretches, eight o'clock, 8 a.m. practice. You're done by 10.30. You go have a snack, watch film for two and a half hours, get lunch, go out for a walkthrough, have another snack. Then you've got the night practice. Then you've got more film and then you're to bed and you're doing that every single day for two weeks. And you're just beat to hell. You're brought to your, you're completely broken down to be built back up to this unshakable warrior that ends up on the field on the gridiron on Sundays. 
So then you're in the season, and you really have to take it, the season as one game at a time because anytime you get too far ahead, you lose it. Or if you get stuck in the past, we fucked up that game, messed up, missed that block, we lost that game, whatever it was, you lose it. So in the season, it's one week at a time. We call it one week seasons. You get through that season. I never was lucky and I never played in a team that made the playoffs, which is a huge thing in the NFL. But so the season comes to an end. For me, it was always like beginning of January. You go into the off season and it's just like this relief because you've hit the end of this year, this season that you spent the entire year preparing for. There's an interesting thing that would happen because you're, you've been running on adrenaline and cortisol now for about six to eight months. You have this massive fall off a cliff. Usually you get sick. You have like a week or two of can't get out of bed, depression-like symptoms, if not just a full-blown depression. Then you start to pick yourself up. You take your off-season trips, maybe a month, take a month off, and then you start training again. Mm and get ready, it's another spring. Weightlifting, scrimmaging, summer, two-a-days, season, and it just keeps going, 10 plus 15, 20 years. And guys, you get so programmed in this cycle that when it all comes to an end, this is why we see so many guys who become coaches or they become sportscasters or whatever, they stay involved in the game and somehow, because it's so difficult to find yourself out of that landscape for the first time. For me, it was like, I would always say this, it's like I got thrown off the cruise ship without a life preserver in the middle of the ocean. Mm. And I'm going, I don't fucking know anything. I don't know who I am, where I'm supposed to go. I've got no sense of direction. For the first time in my life, I'm confronted with the fact that every relationship I've ever had, friends, family, otherwise, has come through this prism of me being a superstar athlete. You know, I really, there was always this underlying current for me of being a writer. Mm. And I come from this family, really unique blend of artists and athletes. And it's taken me a really long time to learn about the seasons of artistry Mm. or the seasons of being a human, really. And there's a time for sowing the seeds, planting the seeds, doing a lot of fucking work, tilling the soil, you know, weeding the weeds, preparing the earth for the thing that you're going to grow. And then Mm. you plant the seeds and then there's some waiting time. It's not always because I was stuck in this thing, in the football mentality of I've got to be producing and creating constantly. And if I'm not, I'm no good. What the fuck am I worth? I've got nothing to offer if I'm not constantly like building the castle, you know. And um, it's been a big part of my journey. And, you know, it's something that I just have such reverence for and respect for Jared and what he's done in his life. And this feels like, this feels really important for me in my life. Mm. Having this trip on this summer solstice and really settling into this grander scheme of flow and the flow of nature, Mm. which is us. And speaking to that disconnection, I think specifically in the West, we've just been so programmed with building the empire and producing and creating the, 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 the mega hit or the successful life, whatever that looks like, that we're all fucking burned out and going, wait, there's got to be something else here. Because I thought when I got the house and the car and the million bucks in my bank account, this hole in my heart was going to be filled Mm. and it's not, you know? Um, So it's interesting because in that environment, I feel like you're right to think 
oh, you'd have this really interesting perspective on seasons. But it's so, it's like, you know, it's, it's almost like putting the mouse in the maze or putting the mouse on the wheel. It's just like, get them on the wheel, they start running. And then they don't, they stop when you take them off the wheel, you know? Um, and that's been a big part of my journey coming out of football is like learning about that mm. and settling into that and allowing myself to have those seasons, allowing myself to have an off season. You know, I was thinking about yesterday. I have this interesting through line in my life of taking trips away from like my family and having this feeling of being homesick mm. that's really a blanket over guilt for not being there for people because I feel like every, I need to be responsible for everybody's well-being. Mm. And this is the first time, this is the first trip I've taken like this where I'm far away from everybody I know and love. Like my mother, my daughter, my brother, my father, those people in particular. And I'm just totally free from it. Yeah. I'm getting to just be right here in joy and in the love of the experience of being in, with these people and on this river. Yes. You know? I think the, there's a gift in that, right? Like, I've done some really deep men's work and you, you kind of sequester yourself, right? It, in the in the in the more ancient notion of time you'd have a rite of passage right traditionally mm -hmm. young women would become women taken off by a group of other women or young men would become men through that process and we've lost that i think culturally much to our own detriment uh-huh and what i think that is is a marking of a transition you know a transition totally. from one phase of life into the next and what i've learned about both of you and i admire about both of you men is you kind of followed the societal path, right? You were a stockbroker, a successful stockbroker, and you chose to leave and start the most epic of, I don't even, biodynamic is not even, doesn't even do it justice of, of farms, right? That's, that's a huge identity shift, right? And you went from the NFL to now, you know, leading incredible workshops based in what would, not be called probably in Texas football circles, you know, like yeah. uh, the, the essence of performance. Yet we now know, of course, breath work, yoga, all these are ancient sciences that have profound efficacy in fostering those transitions. But I think on a macro level, as, as we think about amidst this incredible sort of apex of a season, how we effectively transition, which I think nature shows us in its cycles, as individuals now more than ever we need it yeah. as well right because our parents generation you know was sort of work somewhere for 30 years and you get the gold watch whereas now the average person i think will work something like 22 jobs during the course of their their lives wow and 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 if you put all of your identity into your work that becomes a, a constant cycle of totally. of of a potential inner conflict and so for me one of the gifts of this time is the ability to silence the monkey mind, the, 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 the noise and tune into that, that inner signal. Do you have any thoughts on, cause I know you've gone through that transition. Do you have any insights you could share around the tools that you find can be really helpful for those who are going through transitions in their own lives? as it relates to whether it be the nature immersions you create, the incredible elixirs of life that you create, you know, the, the way that you think about your farm, um, any sort of tangible uh, insights around how people can approach that notion of transition and their identity and, and, yeah. and the tools they can use to help foster it. Yeah, big time. Um, it's also sort of, I think my answer to your first question about creating the experience in general, mm. uh, I think the answer is, and so you were just talking about like the benefits of this trip as well, it all ties together, but is just mindfulness in general, a mindfulness practice. Um, because I'll go back to that in a second, but like the answer to this experience is 
how did I create this experience? Um, it was by applying the lens of mindfulness to my decisions. So I could have easily selected any bottle of wine to serve you or any type of beef and simply by thinking about those choices and then making choices that were resonant with my values and you know mutually beneficial for the producer of those products, the land that they work on, the communities that surround those lands, everyone that's involved with it, all of that requires some mindfulness. Otherwise you could just go buy the most convenient source of these items, right? So um, for me, when I left New York City and took on a farming apprenticeship in Georgia um, and left every single thing that I ever knew, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, playing video games, recreational sports, football, lacrosse. I had no connection to nature of any kind. Uh, I had been apple picking once or twice. Um, that was it. And then I uh, started um, working with a, a, a mindfulness coach, which nowadays there's just endless free resources for this. So yeah. I happen to have been working with a mindfulness coach and I would go get like one hour guided meditations from her. That was my first experience with mindfulness. And so I would recommend listening to guided meditations because there could be sort of this barrier to entry where you think like, oh, I have to know how to meditate. I have to, you know, it's hard or, or any of these <laughs> thresholds that I have to get through. Listening to a guided meditation is no different than listening to a song and it's got the benefits of like getting a massage, you know? And it's super accessible now. Yeah, exactly. Head there's, space. There's free or, source of it anyways. Yeah. And so a dedicated mindfulness practice sort of gives you the ability to start applying the muscle, the lens of mindfulness to your, to your decisions more generally. Mm. So when I developed a mindfulness practice, I became aware that the environment around me, the New York Stock Exchange, the food I was eating, the lifestyle I was living was very toxic. And I thought, oh, well, with my mindfulness practice and with my clean diet and all that, I can buffer that toxicity. I can go to the gym before work. I can take breaks in the middle of the day when people think I'm in the bathroom to do squats in the stall and keep my body moving. I can do a walking meditation when I'm sent as the intern to go get coffee. Instead of feeling like it's a jerk job, I can approach it with reverence. Mm. And that's how I lived my life for a couple of years in New York City right after college. Until again, mindfulness allowed me to recognize that I didn't like that. I, for the first time in my life, was able to identify what I do and don't like. That was the major shift for me. Yeah. Most people, including myself prior to that moment, don't know what they they like or not they've they've been they've been conditioned in a way where they don't have to actually it doesn't actually ever cross their mind because they're very busy with work they're very busy with family they're very busy with all their obligations and tv watching and whatever they have going on but there's no headspace for that to occur there's actually just to interject there's this notion of eulogy versus resume goals most people live their life in accordance with resume goals never really thinking about how they want people to feel at the, or how they want to feel at the end of their own life. And like, how do they want to be remembered? And I think one of the more powerful exercises is to actually visualize your own eulogy and who are the people you would want to be there and how you'd want to be remembered. And orienting that is more your true north rather than like, oh, I've got to get this thing. Like Let you were me saying, get the Evan, job. I got to get this and then I'll be happy. It's, it's the totally opposite, it's right? It's how we're, who we're being that attracts our sense of wellness and well-being. The other thing I'll just share is the number one regret of the dying is that they never took a shot at living life of their own on their own terms, right? Exactly yeah. what you're saying. That's right? what they, mindfulness allowed me to exactly. recognize. I, I knew that I was obsessed with regenerative farming and farm to table restaurant scene in Brooklyn where I was living. The fact that these restaurants were doing something different than the thousand other restaurants, that they had relationships with small ranchers outside New York and they were sourcing whole animals, that they had butchers, that they were sourcing from local organic farms. All of that was fascinating to me. I knew, but I also knew that I had a 30 year Wall Street career ahead of me and I had to make millions of dollars. And then I would retire from Wall Street mm. and then I would do these things as a second career. Life post retirement. Right. And then so sitting there at, you know, the age, I don't know, I'm so bad with numbers. Let's say late twenties, probably. I was sitting there or mid twenties and um, I, I just had the realization that if I didn't start dedicating my life to what I was passionate about right now, I 
could die before it ever happened. Mm. Um, and I just knew that I didn't have any clear path ahead of me, like promotions. I'm going to end up on some desk trading desk somewhere at some hedge fund, like vaguely. Okay. But there was literally, it was like I was blind in front of me. And then the second I started looking inward and following the things that I, I was obviously passionate about, I just considered them the things I did after work. The second I started focusing on them, I not only had a clear path, but I had probably, I don't think it stopped. I was about to say a 10 to 15 year period of what just felt like unlimited downloads of creativity and inspiration and the ability to execute on them. Mm. Um, so like almost anything that I could think of as it related to our brand and our goal and our objectives, we've been able to pursue and achieve like this trip is an example of them. This is such a random kind of idea to come up with. We're not a whitewater rafting company. You know, if anything, people know us as a skincare company. And so there's not many skincare companies holding trips like this, but it was this dream that I had and it's, through mindfulness, you know, and applying my attention to these inspirations that I feel come in primarily from nature, much like a songwriter says, like the song just falls into their head. I think when you're in love with something and you're passionate about what you're doing, um, it's sort of like easy street. And every single time I needed help or a teacher or instruction, multiple options would present themselves in a way that in Robins. retrospect is just, you know, unfathomably coincidental. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like when you, once you commit to l living life in a different way, it's like our, our friend Boyd Vardy talks about with Lion Tracker's Guide to Life, that notion of people get lost because they're trying to know exactly where the lion's going to be, right? Where their, where their life needs to be. And they get lost in the unknowingness of it, Ooh. where really the, the trick is, finding the first track, right? Like your f next first step. Like most people, I feel like never take the first step because they feel like they've got to know where the end zone is, you know, yeah. like before they even embark on it. And I love what you're saying because what it evokes in me is that notion of providence and like through mindfulness and they, in Vedic meditation, they call it your charm, right? Like those insights, those downloads, it's, it's the, it's the charm that, the things, it's the music that wants to live through you, you know? We mm. become a vessel for that music. And I feel like that's such a beautiful um, discovery mm. and such a beautiful tool. Um, Eb, what do you find to be, you know, Jared's spoken of mindfulness. I know obviously that's something you actually teach now as well. What do you find to be some of the greatest ways to evoke that song that wants to live through you. Mm. Love that, dude. I love that because I was thinking when we were listening to Sonia's music about cultivating your vitality. Mm. And back to your earlier point about the digital landscape, time, it's moving faster and faster. And if we're, any of us, we've got this thing in our pocket that's hyper addictive, that we're all on too much. Mm -hmm. And it's, it feels like this, like vortex down, because your, your life force just gets sucked into it. Sucked away. And how, what are the things we do in our lives that spring us forth with more vitality? And um, you know, it's so funny, he says the guided meditations, because for me, guided meditations was the beginning of me really finding myself and tuning into that totally. charm, tuning into my inner signal, tuning into me, myself, underneath all the shit, you yeah. know? I'd put on guided meditations and I'd be up at 5 a.m., grab the dogs, 
get outside, go for a long walk, just listen to guided meditations and saying affirmations. And for me, a big part of, I think uh, outside of your, your inner work, your, the work you do when no one's watching, your meditation practice, your connection to God, prayer, affirmations, your self-talk, mm. essentially. How are you talking to yourself when you're just sitting there? Yes. When you're lying in bed at night, what's going through your head? Because this is a super fucking powerful thing, dude. You know? And it'll, it'll go to the far reaches of the universe. And it'll think about all the shitty, dark things in between. And we have agency over this thing if we choose and if we're aware, if we are aware enough. And um, I think that something that's really important for us these days in particular is doing things that are, make us feel uncomfortable. Yeah. For me, 12-step programs, going to Al-Anon meetings, mm. started out really uncomfortable, and it was the most profound work of my life, especially in men's meetings. Mm. To sit in a group of men, sit with a group of men that I'd never met before, and share gut-wrenching shit, simple stuff, funny stories, whatever was alive in you in that moment, because in that environment, you're really called forth to share. You're encouraged to, to share with the group. Mm. And acting classes, things that would just get you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. You know, do an exercise where you stand across from somebody and just look into their eyes without saying anything for 10 minutes. See what happens. Mm. You know? It's confronting. It is. In a beautiful way. And... Or the teacher turns on a song and is just like, let your body start moving, you know, start dancing. Um, and all of these things are ways to, to learn about you and cultivate that vitality. Um, so one thing, yoga has been a huge part of my life. My mom started taking me to yoga when I was 10. Really laid the foundation for everything I'm doing now. And coming out of football, it was this process coming back there because I was totally fucking lost, dude. Yeah, yeah. Coming out of that. It's totally fucking lost. And there was a lot of breathless desperation running into things, starting a CBD company over here, trying to do this over there, doing all, saying yes to every, anything and everything that would come my way. And it took a long time for me to slow down to get to the mindfulness place. My mm. whole life had to come crashing down first. Then I found 12 steps and I found, came back to therapy, found meditation, the guided meditations, started building myself back up from zero. Um, One of the things, a, a profound experience I had going back to the power of the mind and our agency over it and whether or not we choose to have that or not, because our whole reality is our perception of yeah. it, you know, and that's so cliche, but it's just the truth. If you're walking around asleep in a state of, yeah, but it's because of them since this is happening, I can't do X, you know, that place that we've all been in at one point or another. Until you have that realization, like, Jared, you're like, I like everything but my job, you know? Like, everything in my life is great, but I'm still coming to this place and doing this job that I don't have any interest in, that fills me with this angst and resistance. Why? Why do I do that? And then one day you take the leap and you go fucking do the internship at the Georgia Bi Biodynamic Farm, yes. you know? Yeah, 
because he's making me remember that there was actually a specific tool and teaching from Paul Cech that enabled me to apply mindfulness in towards what you described as a North Star. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, Super Bowl. It's his concept of a dream line. And so it turns out, once you understand this concept, that the major problem that most people are facing if they're facing problems is that they haven't identified their dream. And a dream has to be bigger than whatever you're most afraid of. Mm. Because like, let's say your dream is to be really healthy. It could be a small personal goal, which we'll call my dream of being healthy. But my family eats pizza every Friday night. I'm going to continue eating pizza until I love my dream more than I'm afraid of being made fun of by my family or left out of my family for not joining them on pizza night and bringing bringing the the grilled steak or whatever I'm having is my new choice, right? So at work, for example, on the floor of the stock exchange, but I started bringing in my own lunches as opposed to eating the sandwiches and the pizzas and the things that we ordered every single day, I (laughs) earned the new nickname, the weirdo. Yeah. Immediately. The weirdo. Look at his lunch, the weirdo. Because I was making new choices in line with my values that I had identified that were dream affirmative. So now I can make dream affirmative decisions because I have a dream. The picture is the most helpful part. Yeah. So if the dream is the bullseye on the target yep. and I'm an archer, the line between me and the bullseye, that's my dream line. So now I know exactly where I want to go. How do I stay on my dream line? By living a life according to values that I identify for myself. Yes. In Paul's system, it's the four doctor model. Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, Dr. Movement, and Dr. Happy. The last four doctors you'll ever need. That's their trademark. I love that. Hashtag. Yeah. Uh, catchphrase. But so like, you know, I eat a certain type of food. I drink a certain amount and type of water. I move my body in certain ways. I work out. I do activities that expend more energy than they generate. And I work in. I do activities that generate more energy than they expend. Dr. Quiet. I rest. I meditate. I take trips like this. Dr. Happy, I do things just for joy, things that make me happy when I was a kid, things that make me happy now. And so if I get invited to a concert that's at 2 a.m. and it sounds awesome, I can either choose to go knowing that I'm breaking my values on Dr. Quiet because I go to bed at 10 or whatever, or I can not go because I'm making a dream affirmative decision, even though it would have been fun to go to the concert, I'm now staying on my dream line. Yes. So I can make the choice. I can make yes or no decisions based on what I love and the direction I want to walk in, as opposed to, frankly, walking in circles because you don't even know where the bullseye is. Yeah. I think that's super, it ties in beautifully to what Ed was talking about with the confronting your, your comfort zone. Because honestly, also, I love what you said about I was a weirdo. Because that's what everyone's fucking afraid of. Yeah. Everyone is rendered impotent by their fear of other people's judgments. Or not only that, their projection of right. the fear of other people's judgments. But I had a new dream. I you had, care. exactly. But once you had that dream, you were like, okay, I don't care. And you're willing to take on whatever moniker. Because at the end of the day, honestly, like the disproportionate weight we give to our perception of other people's opinions is is... Is, is just an illusion that keeps us from ever expressing ourselves or taking the chance on the discomfort that will be our ultimate liberation, right? Like mm-hmm. any hero's journey archetype, right? Luke Skywalker, you know? He has no idea how he, he feels the force lives in him, but he has no idea how to access it, right? right? But once he commits, all of his allies come into play, right? Leia, Han Solo, Yoda, right? And, and, and that's one of the things I think about is like, once you're, cause like, you know, this is intimidating for a lot of people, yeah. you know? And what you're doing is you're creating a, a container that has a perception, which is actually largely a fallacy of the judgments of like, will I be safe? Will I be, you know, uh-huh. all the thing, little monkey mind things you go into. And the, and the river is such a beautiful metaphor for life because it's like, okay, yeah, there are moments that are rocky, that are bumpy, where you think you're gonna fall on your ass or, or fall in the water as you did, you know? And, but get, guess what? You got back in the boat and you were happier for, for, for falling, you know what I mean? And like, that's, that's fucking epic, dude. It was a fun experience. You know, and, and, and also I'm brings living, us baby. joy. Like, yeah. look at us, we're all lit up, you know? Totally. And I feel like that's the thing is like, 
you also start to, I, I initially talk about your song, but like you attract your band, you attract your people uh -huh. when you start to sing your music, you oh, know, when you shoot time. that arrow, you know? Yeah. And it just comes right in. It comes right in. Yeah. So, well, what you're, one thing I want to share there, Michael, which we talked about yesterday doing the gazing exercise with Nathan. And this is with anything where you're uncomfortable or you're fe feeling fear and you take that one more breath, that one more step and you come through the other side and yes. you make it. Yes. And you realize, holy shit, there was a whole other dimension of life that I didn't even know existed yep. before I just faced that thing. Yes. And your whole thing changes. Your whole perception of the world, yourself, what you're capable of completely shifts in a fucking profound way that leads you one step closer to your ultimate destiny. Yeah. You know? And uh, that's been, you know, what, what you guys were saying earlier has just been such my practice over the last few years of letting go of the end result, putting one foot in front of the other, man. Yep. And even now, it's such a fine tuning because these things come in all the time. Totally. Text this person, call them, do this, write that, go to here, go get a coffee over there. And we ignore it all the time, yep. you know? But what if you just like do that thing? You reach out to that person or you go to that place. You're like, I don't even know why I thought to go there, but I'm just going to go there. And you go there and you run into your friend that, you haven't seen in 20 years who's just like brings joy and like inspiration into your life. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And you just follow those little, those little whispers from God. And it's just taking you one step at a time. It might not even make sense. You know, that thing over there that you feel has nothing to do with this top, getting to the top of that mountain over there. And yet somehow one day you find yourself up there and you're going, man, I'm here. <laughs> yep. Holy shit. Yep. Let you me, know? Let me ask you a question. So that veil that disappears after you break through and you're in the example of gazing, but it could be anything. I mean, it's not even a real thing. It's, a, it's, it's invisible. Uh -huh. It's a fake veil yeah. that we do have to break through. But it's like, what is that veil? Right. It's a form of blindness, maybe, mm. is what's coming to me. It's a form of like inner vision blindness or distraction. Illusion. Well, it's, I think it's the illusion created by your Projection. perception yeah. that's conditioned on everything you've come to believe about who you are, what's true in the world, what's right, what's wrong, etc. It's a default operating system. Yeah. It's there because you're gazing into this person's eyes and you're, there's like this whole program running of there's this whole programming, by the way, I'm totally spellbound by the moon and the star. I'm yes. guessing that might be Saturn. I don't Oh my goodness. So for those listening or watching, you know, here on the summer solstice, we're looking at a crescent moon with, what appears to be almost maybe even a, a planet. It's yes, got to be a planet. I don't know Literally planet, directly though. 180 degrees sort of below its bottom tip. And it's absolutely spellbinding. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And Sonia said a really interesting thing about music being this vehicle of remembrance. Mm. Music and film have had such an important role in my life yes. of reminding me who I am, where I come from, what's possible. And to your point, Jared, of what is that illusion? What is that veil of illusion of thing? And it's, for me, from a neurological, psychological standpoint, neuropsycho standpoint, it's all of this old programming running of, oh, we're not... This is uncomfortable. It's supposed to be weird to just gaze into another person's eyes without turning away or without giggling or laughing. And then you let that go. That falls away and you see the truth. It's as if you're peering through this window into the soul realm. 
where it's all just one thing. Yeah. You know, there is no you and me. There is no Michael and Evan and Jared. Yep. It's just us here. Yes. And so, we're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember, dude? <laughs> yeah, totally. We were in the fucking soulscape. Yeah. Hanging out, talking about this life. Yeah. You right. know? Yeah. So what's so beautiful about his answer is that it's also the answer to your first question, which is that what is this experience? The experience is a curated experience of what? Removing all of these things yeah. that simply prevent us from remembering what is always true. Uh -huh. I, so I, I actually, people call, like talk about awakening. I actually prefer the term remembering yeah. because I much, think it's, it's just, we are all uh -huh. inextricably linked. We are interdependent. We are one, right? Like there's a beautiful uh, Chinese text, ancient Buddhist text called the jewel net of Indra. And it's about mm. in the web of life at the intersection of each points in those webs is an infinite, like a, Mandelbrock sequence of, of, of possibility, which is the microcosm that is the macrocosm mm. as exact mirrors of each other. And as you so beautifully said, this is the removing of the illusion. It's the taking away of all the things that we get caught up that, that basically become one more aspect of the monkey in the monkey mind. Uh -huh. All, all the, the churning of the hamster wheel, as you talked about, of that mouse that we have that lives in our head. And, and, what, and at least for me, what, what occurred to me as I was meditating at the river was... And I was actually back in my things I we all know, right? Like I know gratitude has a marked effect if I actually practice it on not only my happiness, abundance, whatever you want to call physiology. it. Physiology. Physiology. But I was just marveling at this beautiful, <laughs> jagged mountain and thinking about the bears we saw yesterday and like looking for like a big horn sheep and just like seeing the butterfly float by. And you know, it just strikes me. It's like, man, we chase these things that just do not matter, you know? And here we're, we're, we are wealthy beyond measure. We have won the fucking lottery. Like if you go outside or you have the gift, which we do if we make the time and space to come to one of these deep nature, these places, you know, where, where nature is still, the water is still clean. We drank from it literally today from a cold water creek. Like I literally filled a wa my water bottle up and bathed in that water and felt a vitality more than five cups of coffee. You know, like I was awake, I was alive. And yet we, we chase this wheel of thinking we gotta, we gotta get something to then feel a certain, and it's like, man, we already won the lottery, bro. We just gotta go outside, you know, like, like, and, and have a beautiful dinner. Like, that's the other thing I just wanna acknowledge. Like. You know, and I, I, I love great food, but like, you know, I don't always eat amazingly. But the intentionality around the inputs, right? Mm. Because we have the macro input, right? Which is the environment around us and the ability, anyone listening, to go into a place of deep nature. But I think the other piece that we, that we don't think about enough is how the other aspects of nourishment. So I never, t today we painted our... Uh, you know, as a man, you, you don't often associate getting a facial with like, you know, whatever masculinity, you know, I could have been in my, you know, hamster yeah. wheel thinking about it, the but forget it, you know, Ev's an NFL player, you know, he's getting a face, he's getting a facial. <laughs> totally. So you know what? Let's get involved, you know? Yeah, bro. But, and, and but that's the, the but, comfort zone, dude. Exactly. It's just like we broke through. it. Yeah. And it was fun. It was, it was not only fun. Like I literally, it was also amazing. I was had, it was having my face paint and like also the tenderness, like the eye gazing, the tenderness of someone actually totally. taking their time to to uh to make you feel vital you know and then doing the same the the, the reciprocity we talked about th that today as well right like when we go to these sacred lands not just going like we're hiking and out for a walk but like we went to these glyphs you know these these glyphs of the people of these lands the guardians of these lands and we actually set intention and asked for permission and for me, I had an incredibly deep moment of, of thinking about the, t you know, of time, you know, like when were these painted? What was life like during those times? And you how know? similar were they, they were to us. How similar, they're yeah. They're having the same feelings, obviously. Any human who stood in that spot we stood today would have the same feelings. Yes. You could almost look at the paintings and you're like, yeah, man, I get it. You know? Universality, to bring it back, that, that notion of 
of course, the beauty, like flowers are different expressions of beauty, but the, the oneness of beauty, right? And, and so the, the, the inner being the expression of the, the expression of the outer and, and to bring it full circle and which is kind of where I would love to get your insights on. And I know we're going to close here shortly because we're losing light, but for me, what I call finding center. So for me, one of the principles I'm really thinking about a lot is I told you guys earlier, I studied in Sri Lanka with a traditional healer and he described to me health as balance. And he also called it the heart rhythm. So it was the music of the heart, but to sometimes people get out of rhythm, Mm. even though their heart of course is still beating true, you know, Uh our intuition, our greater intelligence is still there. Our mind can take us out of the rhythm of our heart. Mm and we lose center. And I was off center coming here. And today I return to center. (laughs) Love that. You know, and we all have that ability. You know, we all know when we're feeling a bit off and yet we sometimes forget the inputs, the nourishing food, the nourishing environments, the nourishing people that can foster through very simple means that sent that centeredness. Do you guys have any sort of, as we move towards a close, any insights uh, uh, from your own experience that would be beneficial to those listening on how one can, or you find particularly poignant way of returning to center? You want me to start? Please. <laughs> Honestly, it's, the practice we started with yes we opened with yes and that's been i mean i've been meditating every day for the last six years and that practice has probably been the most impactful because i don't have to be anywhere in particular to do it yeah i can do it sitting in this chair. I've been doing it the whole time. Yes. Tuning into my breath, noticing where I'm holding tension in my body. You could do it when you go for a walk. Like when you go for a walk, let's take a moment, really feel your gait, feel your feet on the floor. How's your body moving? Where do you have impingements? Where are you holding on? There's this incredible thing because the body is just this physical manifestation of the mind and everything else that's happening inside of you and what's ever, everything you've ever been through in your entire life. Yes. It's just this incredible organic organism that holds memory. Like every fucking fiber, nook, cranny, cell of your being holds the memory of your life in it and your ancestors' lives. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you're walking around, right? And you're living life, not even realizing how you're holding on to all of this stuff. And so simply, man, you can just start to bring attention to it. You're not going to fucking clear out the room in one day. Right. Little by little, one moment at a time, one walk at a time, one sit, one chat, one dinner, one workout at a time. Just keep coming back to center and going, where am I holding on? Yes. Because that holding on is some fear that you're not good enough. You're not doing it right. I can't hold, I can't let this go. Oh, you know, you just let it go. Beautiful. So every moment, every moment that you catch yourself flying out there, you're way out there in fucking Saturn. Your mind is a million miles away. You could bring it right back to center in a moment on mm. one breath. Your breath is always here, man. And you're always in your body. You're never anywhere else. You can always come back right here and just take this, use this instrument that we've been gifted with to just as the vehicle to bring you back to center over and over again. Beautifully said. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, guys. I would um, I would echo that Um, to make a novel point. I think that I would to recenter myself in there's probably a lot of ways I would try to do it if, you know, meaning at any given moment, what I think I need to recenter myself might be different from any other moment. Sure. The general theme of them would be to move closer to the earth. Yes. Mm. So I would 
you know, maybe that's a physical, literal answer. Like earlier today, I got lightheaded. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, within a second, I just lied down on the ground. Yes. 30 seconds later, Grounding. something occurred to me. I was like, oh, I forgot to put that St. John's word out, out in the sun. And I jumped up off my feet. I was completely re-energized and re-centered. <laughs> you know, 30 seconds <laughs> on the ground is, is all it took. Yeah. And uh, I was like dizzy for a, a moment before that. So going to the ground. But that could tie back to what I was saying earlier, like seasonal awareness, participation yep. in the seasons through celebration of seasonal changes and observing the season. So it could be like going to bed at, on time, wearing my amber glasses after sundown, yep. um, waking up with the sunrise and getting my feet on the earth. So somehow I want to move closer to the earth and the natural rhythms of Mother Earth to recenter myself. And then the second thing I would say to answer your question is asking for help. Mm. So I think that like, uh, you know, we have like uh, a lot of people can't ask for help. Yeah. And I don't remember if I'm making this up or if I heard this somewhere, but I feel like it's like 80 percent asking for help. Fifteen, to, you know, 15 to 19 percent prayer and, yeah. and mindfulness practice and like one percent like what I'm actually doing. Yeah. Um, because when I'm asking for help and I'm engaged with other people and I'm focusing on what I love and I'm passionate about. Uh, like we were saying earlier, it all sort of just flows, you know? Yes. And uh, then I can take care of myself That's as really well. That's really powerful, dude. That is, that is really powerful. I, and I think it speaks to, you know, what is asking for help. It bring, kind of brings it us to kind of full circle because it, it really is about knowing where you're nourished, you know? Mm. And, and knowing who nourishes you, right? Because we, we have to nurture our relationships and build people in our lives that are batteries that charge us up, you know, and where there is reciprocity and we can ask for help and someone who, you know, um, has, has the courage to, to, t to make that ask, but then also the beauty that, that, that can afford in the dance between giving and receiving. And I think what we see before us is our beautiful instances of that everywhere, you know, Today I saw, I think it was an osprey take a, a you know, like a, I don't know if it was a salmon, but you know, a bass or a trout, something, some beautiful fish from, from the water. And, you know, we saw the bears yesterday with the, with the berries, you know, and it's like everywhere you see these beautiful um, exchanges and we're, 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 as we speak, running out of light. So I want to, I want to draw us to a close. First thing I want to do is acknowledge each of you. Uh, Jared, I want to first acknowledge you for think having the courage to to ask the questions of yourself that led you on this beautiful journey and has now led all of us on a life-changing remember forever beautiful journey and for anyone listening highly recommend I don't know if you're gonna do more of these trips but I would give it a, a profound endorsement but also um, and I'd love for you to share you know be here farm I mean, of the most incredible internal inputs, external inputs that you can receive because you have such a level of integrity to your ingredients and sourcing. And I think, unfortunately, that's an anomaly in this day and age. Yeah. But like yesterday, I literally was making like the most potent, <laughs> I don't even know what you call it, elixir. elixir. And I accidentally, because I was so excited, <laughs> dropped in like one of your serums that's actually your skincare. For body. But yeah, I didn't want to waste oil. it, you know? Yeah. And I was like, bro, can I like drink that? He's like, yeah, it's fine. And I was like, of course. <laughs> like, you're not going to put anything in there that isn't actually like you could ingest, you know? So anyway, I want to acknowledge you. Um, where can people find you in your work? So uh, we're on Instagram at Be Here Farm, and they can head to BeHereFarm.com as well. We'll be um, relaunching that. It's under construction like at the time of this recording, but I have a feeling it'll be up by the time of the people are listening to this. So BeHereFarm.com and at BeHereFarm should have all the info they need. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks Def for asking. I guess I'll also acknowledge, you know, we're on this trip. Evan and I, Michael were here. There's 17 of us in total. Mm. The other talented facilitators who be here brought in to put this trip together, we've mentioned them. I'll just point out Sonia. She's at Dopero on Instagram. She, mm. That's her stage name, Dopero. And then- We just saw her give like the most amazing stunning. performance. Yeah, longtime friend of mine performed at my wedding and a lot of other special ceremonies in my life. And then we've been eating Chef Aaron Goldstein's food and that's his Instagram, at Chef Aaron Goldstein. And then we mentioned a couple times Dr. Nathan Riley, who's um, at 
I think is the holistic OBGYN, but it could just be at Dr. Nathan Riley. But if you Google him, you'll find him. And, you know, these are incredible people who have just poured themselves into this experience as well this week. And speaks to your, to your notion of asking for help or finding the symbiotic relationships wherein each creates something more exponential Absolutely. for the whole. Yeah. Thank you. And I want to acknowledge you, Evan, because... We didn't know each other. Uh, I, I've known of you through quality friends, uh, but I did your yoga this morning, did your, your, your meditation and your breath work. We've had a chance now to drop in on the river. We had dinner together and just really admire, obviously you, you operated at the peak and in some aspects, I mean, in this country, the NFL is almost it's basically religion, you know, yeah. and therefore, you know, therefore the identity, which I can relate to having in the past created something that I really highly identified with that was successful. Yet when it was time for that season to end, it can be very hard to release that identity. Mm. And some people, you know, everyone knows in a town, the college quarterback that lives his glory days for the rest of his life on the couch drinking beers yeah. with his buddies. <laughs> but it takes a lot of courage to say, beautiful, that was a beautiful chapter that forged a lot of who I am, but it isn't the entirety of me. Mm. And so taking that step and also embracing and I think sharing and being an advocate for athletes who are who then have such downstream influence around some of these holistic practices, like you mentioned, the mindfulness, yoga, mm -hmm. um, all of your other work. And of course, you have Evan Flow, you know, your incredibly insightful podcast. W where's the best place for people to find you and reach out to you? Uh, Instagram's great at EDS Britain. That's Ed's Britain. It's my three first three initials, Evan Daniel Smith Britton. People always call me Ed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why. It, I think some, somehow Evan Britton was picked or E Britton was already taken at the time I created the Instagram. So it's at EDS Britton. Um, that's my main flow of social media. I'm also on TikTok at the same, I think, um, and then my podcast, The Ebb and Flow. My book is on Amazon, The Ebb and Flow, Basic Tools to Transform Your Life. And you can find all of that at evanbritton.com also. Ebb also hosts live events and retreats called Heal and Flow. Beautiful. Right, which has its own Instagram, and he promotes it on his regular Instagram as well. Beautiful. Well, I highly recommend you check these two wonderful men out. I have, it's been a true honor and a privilege to get to know you both. Uh, not that we're finished, we're just getting started, but <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna honor and acknowledge you both. Uh, it's been a true pleasure. And I don't say that about everyone. I mean, I'm a, I generally obviously find the gold in everyone, but there's definitely some people that are more your, your kind of song, you know? Like uh -huh. there's, there's people who, who are your band that play your music, you know? And certain people you don't have the same level of resonance with, you know? But you guys are good music, you know? your good music. And I just want to also close by thanking everyone for listening, uh, encouraging you to, to do the kinds of practices that we've shared today. And I think I'm, I'll close by saying, get closer to the earth, because uh -huh. on this day, the summer solstice, I think that insight resonates with me most profoundly today. You know, we are still humbly spinning on a massive goldenly beautiful pair, uh, you know, spaceship called the earth through, through the solar system. And it is the lottery. I mean, cosmically speaking, right? Like in terms of what we're able to witness, bear witness experience in this lifetime, if we prioritize it. And this has been an incredible reminder of the medicine of place and the medicine of people in the right place. And so on this summer solstice, I just want to encourage you guys to get out in deep nature. And I want to honor and acknowledge this incredible nature all around us. The beautiful moon, beautiful waters, sacred water, sacred fire. Um, Mother Earth, Father Sky, thank you for the gifts of this life. And thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. And we're out. Amen. Amen. Boom. Bang. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs>
It was a bit of fun, eh? It's dope, dude. Yeah. Three-way oh, I like it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah,